And we are now live with a special broadcast that is part of the regular programming on Harambe Radio of 21st Century Pan-Africanism Hour with Dr. David L. Horn. And tonight's host will be Dr. Chinzera D. Kahina. And we just wanted to kind of bring into the fold, this is a program that is customarily broadcast live on Harambe Radio. And tonight we're doing it a little with a different niche so that we can have the opportunity to share with our beloved brother, Dr. David L. Horn. I'm going to put it right in your hands because you've been doing this for years. So give thanks for just being <laughs> with us here live on all of our respective networks. You know, we're very grateful, very thankful, and hopefully our listeners too will be able to appreciate the 21st Century Pan-Africanism Hour with our Baba, one of our community's elders, Dr. David L. Horn. Let's welcome Dr. David L. Horn. Beautiful day to do this. Beautiful day to do this. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Chen. Thank you very much. And let's talk Pan-Africanism. Couple of quick things. The few days ago, Ghana went through a four-day celebration, funeral celebration of the life of Jerry John Rawlings, the uh, president of Ghana, the former president of Ghana, who had actually ushered in the democratic republican process that ghana has ghana basically elects a president every four years and then goes through a transition of political authority and they do it without a whole lot of uh hassle they don't people generally don't get killed anymore there are political groups that sometimes go around to pass the word and push people and to urge them to vote, but nothing like the coup d'etats that Africa was famous for in the 1970s and 1980s. Some African countries still go through this. You know, we've had recent examples of in Cameroon and and um, in Central Africa, we've had countries try to basically have an election, but you would have the president or the head of state decide to change the constitution and say that they don't have to have an exit strategy. They don't have to get out of office, even though the constitution in the country has said your term is over after two terms. Uh, Pierre, and Kuzanziza from um, Burundi, for example, a few months ago, decided the constitution said he had to go. So he changed the constitution. Mm -hmm. And a number of African leaders tend to want to do that. If the law does not accommodate them, then change the law. That is not what uh, democracy and particularly a democratic republic call for. So anyway, Mr. Rawlings, for a number of you, you should remember that second only to Osadjifo, Kwame Nkrumah, Jerry Rawlings is the most popular, most well-remembered, most esteemed former Ghanaian leader. Jerry Rawlings can be compared to um, Thomas Sankara mm -hmm. and even uh, Emil Carr Cabral because what you're talking about are leaders who decided that their job, their commitment was to the population, was to the people. It was not to being in charge. It was not to how do we, those in charge, how do we benefit? How do we get rich? How do we make money? Mm -hmm. Corruption, in other words. Uh, these leaders did not do that. In 1979, 
uh, Jerry Rawlings had just become a flight lieutenant in the Ghanaian Air Force. Because Ghana was still going through its military era, the leader, the leaders of Ghana then were a group of military men, mainly the army. Jerry Rawlings and his youth with a handful of other young officers tried to pull a coup d'etat. They tried to take those military leaders out because they did not see Ghana getting better. Ghana was not developing. And the young man and his young friends got slapped down. They got um, beaten up basically by the old men who had no intention of getting out of office. And in the ensuing trial, Jerry Rawlings was given a um, execution date. They were going to kill him because you were the leader. You brought all these young people in here. You have to be punished and you have to be punished as an example. Well, a few months later, Jerry Rawlings' friends came and broke him out of prison. And they had a second coup. They went and took on the older generation, the older army officers, took them out. So the second coup was successful. Rawlings and his group then took most of those old military officers to the beach and killed all of them. Basically, they said, the young people said, you are not going to change. And given that you had tried to execute me, it's time for all of you to go. Now, Jerry Rawlings and his group could have stayed in authority, stayed in power. They could have occupied the presidential house. Instead, they decided to allow the Ghanaian election that was coming up to go ahead and there was a new elected leader. And got, uh, Rawlings and his group basically decided to back away. But a few months later, it became clear that even though uh, Brother Hillel, who had been elected, was a decent brother, he just could not govern Ghana. There were too many things that needed to be done. People need to understand governance is not simply being in charge. Governance is making decisions about sanitation. How do we get it out of, out, of, uh, out of the city? How do we get it out of housing settlements? How do you make sure people have food? How do you make sure people have housing? How do you make sure that people have hospitals to go to? Being in charge means you have to make decisions about resources. So Jerry Rawlings and his group decided they were not ready for that. But after a few months when the elected leadership just couldn't seem to get the job done, they took over in their youth and decided that they would learn how to be in charge in Ghana. And they did. Now, one of the things that got Rawlings a good reputation among Ghanaians was that Rawlings essentially said, the people have to work in order to make a better society. The people working means we have to work. So quite often you would find your Rawlings on the road digging a ditch, or on the road helping to put pipe down for uh, water and for uh, clean water and sanitation. He'd be out there dirty with everybody else. He said, if you do the work, then I have to do the work. That kind of reputation built up for a while. Now, the, in 1992, he decided they would actually form a political party, the NDC, and run for office, and he got elected. Jerry Rawlings actually stayed in office almost 20 years. During the, the last eight years of that, uh, of his administration, 
he had a commission create a Ghanaian constitution that actually laid out what Ghana is presently using, the present democratic system that they're using. And he ran for election again and got elected under the new constitution. When the eight years was up when he had had two terms. He could have, like some African heads of state do, changed the constitution. I want to stay in office. He could have done that. He was in, important enough and popular enough, people would not have complained. But he said, no, the constitution said, my term is up. I will walk away. So he did. He walked away from office. He walked away from the the lionizing that had occurred in Ghana. And he tried to stay out of saying something about the incoming leaders. But some of them were so bad. John Kufour followed him. And uh, Brother Kufour, who may have been a very good and well-trained uh, administrator, basically was not steeped in Ghanaian culture. John Kufour always wore a coat and tie, always wore a Western suit. He did not like or appreciate his administrators or the parliament coming to, to work in Ghanaian cloth. Now, Ghana in its kente cloth was famous all over the world, but you can't wear kente cloth to work in the government in Ghana, according to Kufour. Kufour finishes eight years and he was out. Then you had uh, John Adam Mills, then you have uh, uh, Nana Okufu, who is now elected. Now, Jerry Rawlings did not always get along with all of the presidents who came after him. But in particular, Nana Okufu, who is now the um, head of, of the Ghana government, and Jerry Rawlings basically argued with each other. That, that's Mayo ego mm -hmm. more than anything else. They were both part of the same political party, but I don't want you to tell me what to do. I think I can do it. So you had male ego getting in the way, but at the end, when Brother Rawlings passed away in the hospital last November, Nana Okufu did not back away from it's time to celebrate this man's life. He was a real Ghanaian. He always cared about Ghana and moving forward and building. And he's part of what Ghana needs to recognize and to remember about what leadership is all about. Now, they had arguments between the ethnic group um, chiefs, the wife, Nana Konandu and and the government. So even though he passed away in November 2020, they did not have his funeral, a four-day funeral through Accra. They did not have his funeral until last week. It took that long. But again, he was buried in ceremony. He was buried with respect. He was buried in ways that Africans who have done well who have given their lives to the betterment of their country. He was buried in that style. He was buried like a, a real chief. And uh, having become a well-known diplomat for the African Union, for the UN, and for Ghana, he had a lot of presidents and administrators from other Ghanaian countries coming to pay their respects. He and Mr. Mandela used to be great friends before Mr. Mandela from South Africa passed. Jerry Rawlings was a, an African leader who should be respected, who should be talked about, who should be remembered as someone who gave his life for his country, who gave his life for Pan-Africanism. The man was a great Pan-Africanist. He said, 
like Nkrumah, that Africa's future lay in being able to pull Africans together, to get Africans to agree on a common set of strategies to move forward, and then let's work together to get them done. Again, Rawlings would quite often remind you of Thomas Sankara, who in Burkina, Burkina Faso would ride a bicycle to work, not take a Peugeot, not take a Mercedes. He said government workers did not need to do that. If you are going to, if everybody is poor, you need to be part of that. You should not look rich while your country people are poor. You have to work together to move forward. Jerry Rawlings, my brother, you did it well, and you are to be saluted. That's true. While you were speaking, Baba, we were just sharing some pictures of the honorable former president of Ghana, Jerry Rawlings, in his younger years, you know, the more militant attire, and right. that showing as he moved through his senior years, you know, as well as wearing his official attire, you know, reflective of the culture of Ghana, and also highlighting the importance of his connection and even the, the reference you made to the standing president, president the Honorable President Nana Abu, and watching him sign that scroll of tribute to the Honorable Jerry Rollins. And sometimes it takes a while between the pandemic and the international political affairs that have been influenced by a number of things. It's going to take, things are taking a while. You know, there are other uh, significant dignitaries that the speed in which some of these funerary rites are prepared, and especially in light of all of the public health crises affecting the world, it does take time. So right. it's just wonderful that it, there was still that traditional respect for him as a former head of state, as a distinguished dignitary, you know, irrespective of some of the conflict that surrounded certain decisions, he, his administration, those around him may have made. So I, I'm very grateful that you were able to give us a, a composite of his contributions, as well as encouraging persons that are viewing and listening to this broadcast to do more study and to truly understand the exactly. role, yeah, the role around Pan-Africanism, moving this vibration forward, you know, and moving the work forward so that there was always that vibe, that energy, that practice of the total liberation, because he learned that the total liberation and unification of Africa under a scientifically socialist government, you know, from his 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 from his ancestor, the honorable Osage for Dr. Kwame and Kruma. So there's like a an ongoing piece. And again, select behavior, select engagement practices were different. And again, keeping in mind that the social construct is different. However, this is a wonderful opportunity for those of us that are in this trod, in this path of Pan-Africanism to then see how to elevate 21st century Pan-Africanism like now, because it's going to have a different look than it did in the 1900s. It's going to have a different look than it did during the Pan-African Congresses. And that's right. Up to 1945, it's going to have a different look than what took place in the 1960s. You know, today being the Earth anniversary, solar return, Earth strong to some Earth light of the Honorable Rosa Parks, that brings another layer of conversation to the table. And today is exactly. the anniversary of some other activities. You know, we can go into that legacy because it marks days where hmm, freedom fighters, freedom fighters, Eduardo Mondlane, you know, there we, we forget when they, hey. there was like a series of actors right. that were literally taken out. And because of their quest for Pan-Africanism. And, and we tend to overlook some of that, you know, in some of this work. So I appreciate you bringing that truth to power 
in that versation. That's why it was important, regardless of what will be interfering with us continuing to share these particular notes that are very important in the conversation around Pan-Africanism for us to keep this energy moving forward. You know, your work as one as the international scholar organizer within the UNIAACL RC 2020 brings another layer of conversation into exactly. this work. So I'd like to- And, let me, and yeah. let, me add, let me add two other quick points. Yes, what one, one of the things that um, became recognizable about uh, Brother Rawlings, he was deep into African culture. So you rarely ever, ever saw him in a coat and tie. Even if he had on a tie, he would put on top of that um, Ghana kente cloth or some form of, of um, African cloth. In fact, for all black men, we should be careful about putting a tie that close to our neck any damn way. Wearing this um, European coat and tie does not mean that you are always about business. You are about business when you recognize from whence you come. You need to recognize the aesthetics and the art, the music and the culture of your folk. Gerald Rawlings was like that. He always pushed Ghanaian artists. He always pushed children who were creative, do something, do something that is going to push us forward. The second thing that I wanted to mention, in his youth, uh, before he became the elected president, uh, Rawlings and the group around him, because they had read about scientific socialism, because they had read from Kwame Nkrumah, and they had read from other authors about Africa needs to be organized around scientific socialism. They tried to do it. They tried to run Ghana based on the principles of scientific socialism. But what they found out was what um, the president of Tanzania found out when he tried to do a similar thing in Tanzania. You cannot socialized poverty. There was too much poverty. There were too many resources lacking. You need a working class. You need a large working class if you're going to have socialism. So even though he tried scientific socialism within the Ghanaian crucible, he, he said to him it didn't work. Mm -hmm. And so he went back to a more uh, traditional base and got into um, contacts with the World Bank, into international capitalism, made some mistakes, did some good things, and Ghana is now a growing African country, fully involved with the African Union, but fully involved in, in evolving. It is a nice, Ghana is a nice place. Jerry Rawlings also introduced the idea at the legislative level about setting up a space for diasporans to come back home. Mm -hmm. He tried to get the Ghanaian parliament to write out a plan for getting Africans not living on the continent mm -hmm. who wanted to come back by land, build a family. Here's how you would do it. Here's how you can come and share, be a part of. You can work if you want to work. You can, you can be an entrepreneur. Unfortunately, the parliament gave him a plan that he said was insufficient. Mm -hmm. He ordered them to redo it, but before they finished, he was out of, he was out of office, and his successor, John Kufo, was not interested in uh, any kind of dual citizenship or a diaspora programs that what he was interested in was George Bush and uh, trade, you know, contacts with business people and that Ghana had to deal a lot more with 
private people owning property, private people owning hotels and apartments. He was not, didn't care much about and did not entertain and did not push the whole idea of African people developing their traditional strengths. So Rawlings kept trying to push each succeeding president into trying some form of scientific socialism again, or some form of the people owning their own resources, as opposed to Ghana parceling everything out or getting into debt that it could not repay and always being not a beggar, but a, a debtor. Somebody always owning more of Ghana than the people owned in Ghana. Exactly. So he, he tried to work with what he thought would push Ghana forward. But having tried scientific socialism, and again, he was not an expert. He said he wasn't an expert, but he wanted to see whether it would work in Ghana. He may have tried too early. Ghana may not have been at the level in which scientific socialism could have worked. But when people nowadays are talking about Pan-Africanism, some of them say that Pan-Africanism has to be scientific socialism-based Pan-Africanism, that the two have to go together. One cannot work without the other. I'm not quite sure that is accurate, but I know there are some who make that argument. If that I you can. cannot, right, you cannot, if, yeah, if, but you can. Right. It, it, Go ahead. I'm listening. I just, the reason okay. I'm interjecting, Baba, is for two reasons, because you said something really critical in that. So in the 20th century, because of the dynamics of how capitalist imperialist structure was moving and was prioritized, and there were these these intentional frameworks to make it palatable or make it seem it was inclusive of, right. of people of African ancestry. It was a little more difficult for persons to move into that from a capitalist frame to a more socialist frame, even though it was happening naturally in certain right. circles. However, right. in the 21st century, for sure, with all of the vestiges, structures, frameworks, institutions literally crumbling and becoming quite dissolved in their focus. The right. fact that one of many of the most powerful nations on earth are no longer able to sustain their hold on people of Africa, people of African ancestry, indigenous people, any any and right. any of the nations, ethnicities, or entities that are reclaiming our ancestral sovereignty, capitalism is doing like that old London Bridge is falling down nursery rhyme we used to sing. Right, story. exactly. So now they're you know whether persons want to use the the term scientific socialism or if they desire to, because English is definitely not our first language, so it can be very limiting whether they're going to call it something that is more communal, more harmonious, definitely more social and more humane, it definitely can no longer be that Pan-Africanism can be sustained alongside a capitalist, imperialist, Zionist policy, apartheid remnant. Right, sexist, exactly. Misogynistic. I mean, I could go on and on, but I'm saying that part is why I find that, you know, what Nkrumah put in place, what, what I live to see and witness and work with, you know, being, living, organizing by assignment in Burkina Faso during the leadership of the administration of the Honorable President Thomas Sankara, that's what has kept at least the light, the fire, because right. my vibration and the experience that I had, the the techniques, the strategies that were taught, even if the words used were not necessarily scientific socialism, 
To some, they thought it was communism. That's another layer of conversation. But what was right. clear is that Abba capitalism. It was definitely, exactly. it was right. Abba imperialism. It was definitely, exactly. it was not, we were not using these socioeconomic structures or institutions. Exactly. Right? And, it was a, and, and, and one of the key things that contributed significantly to that volatile antagonism to dismantle and ultimately assassinate the honorable president the most right honorable president and the people's president of Burkina Faso, the Honorable Thomas Sankara, had a lot to do with the priority he placed on women leading right. the revolution. Right. So right. that's another piece that you know that has come full circle from you know the 1980s when he was in his in his flow and had an administration. You know, one of the first, every place we went to, every village, every province that we went to in Burkina Faso, there wasn't just male leadership. It was balanced right. with female leadership. Sisters were not just taking up space. They were in the forefront. In charge. Right. In charge, leading. Yeah. And, and that's the other part about when you're speaking of these systems that it's very important that the the work the implementation of that effort we see some of that in certain countries in the continent now and although right. there's been a shift in certain areas to undo that you know because of these very sex old school yeah. sexes and and you're right but pan pan africanism cannot work pan africanism will not be realized in africa without a full explosion of female leadership. There we go. It it cannot be done. I don't have a the right, the, uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> the the idea of of um, Dr. Julius Nyerere mm -hmm. about African socialism, mm -hmm. which got severely attacked and basically discounted by a number of purists. No, it has to be scientific socialism from Engels and Marx and uh, that group of people. Well, we, we are not Engels, we're not Marx, we're Africans. Yeah. So what, what Julius and Larry came up with, that, that African socialism, which does incorporate female leadership, uh, African culture, aesthetics, the idea of uh, Ubuntu, the idea of making collective decisions, that African socialism will, I think, end up being part of the decision making for modern 21st century Pan-Africanism. It is what Gerald Rawlings was eventually pushing. It has been what other noted African leaders have pushed. It is about who can make the decisions about resources and in whose interest those decisions are being made. If they're being made for French industries and French people, if they're being made for the Belgians, the Danes, the British, the Americans, then that's not helping African people. Yeah. So African socialism has to inculcate mm -hmm. African folk building and working and developing for African folk, yeah. women, children, the people who live on the land are those who have to build to enable the land to develop and to grow and to nurture. That is African socialism. Right. Modern 21st century Pan-Africanism will end up being identified through that kind of process and not through an alien process that does not take into account African culture. It takes into account the culture of the people who were there when that formulation was being made. Right. So the the um, there are those who are saying, for example, that again, Pan-Africanism cannot exist without scientific socialism. I'm not going to get fully into that argument. I'm just saying that that argument seems to not hold the same kind of water that it used to. Mm -hmm. There are others who are saying that 
the Honorable Marcus Garvey was not a Pan-Africanist. Uh, I've just finished writing a little comment about that. I appreciate um, that because that was, I'm not going to say that was funny because it's, it's a very serious accusation or comment yeah. to make. I just wanted to add a very commonsensical space of reference. And that is, again, for persons that are, it's like trying to define a global pandemic oxymoron, double entendre. Right. That is happening in the 20th, the 20th century versus it's like comparing the Spanish flu of the ninth, early 1900s to what's right. happening now. The right. dynamics are different. It was still something. It was still a pandemic, right. but right. the dynamics were different. And Pan-Africanism focused on a very different frame, as I said earlier, in the early 1900s where it was more on the theoretical frame, more of the ideological exchanges, you know, it was more conference oriented, everybody kind right. of came and shared. But by between 1900, those 45 years coming up while the rest of the world was having, you know, World War I, wars in between, stock market crash, and then the World War II, and then claiming a League of Nations that didn't really do what it was supposed to do, and then create- No, I didn't. Right, and then creating a declaration of human rights that didn't right. really do what it was supposed to do. But right. all of these things were surrounding that same Pan-African progression. And exactly. what, what transpired in 45, for example, was more geared on the theoretical ideological conversation has to shift because now we have to reclaim. And They're talking about nationalism. They're talking about exactly. sovereignty of African exactly. states. And if it required armed struggle, then we, right. kind of, we put our suit and tie with the Kente aside, aside right. and we put on our gear and move exactly. forward. And that changed between, again, 1945, coming into the early 1960s, well, late 1950s up to the 1960s. So, you know, we've got these serious areas of demarcation, 1945, 1958, 1963, 1967, and then a whole, then everything transformed. So right. some of the things as you're speaking, I'm just putting up different photographs so persons can also get a glimpse of like who some of these persons were, what they were doing, and then we could recognize what took place in the 60s, you know, civil rights, of course, other activities, how some of that shifted. And if there was a intentional rhythm, it was a rhythm that was yeah. done to create a exactly. form of terrorism by assassinating this one, assassinating that one, it's blowing up, right. blowing up. And this was happening in Africa, in yep. Europe, in India, in Eurasia, all because in your right. Because, right. because of because of the education. True. One of the True. just to add just to add to where you're going with that, in order to maintain the control of the resources, of the African resources, every colonial power, it didn't matter whether it was the French, the Germans, the Belgians, the the English speaking different languages they all had a common agenda mm -hmm. if you want to control african resources then train africans to always want to give you those resources in other words train africans that they didn't create anything they didn't invent anything they have not been important to the world except to work to be laborers and if you teach them that the that their purpose in life, the best that they can do is to become very good servants for Europeans. Right. If when that becomes the essence of your educational system, then you can continually train and retrain different generations of Africans to keep working for you. By the time we got to the 1945 conference, that time was over. We're no longer going to work for you. We have learned some other stuff. We're not going with that education anymore. We are going to retake African land for African people. We are going to use the resources of African land for African people. Yeah. Part of what is 
still incorrect in the pan-African movement forward right now. The African Union's uh, very good attempt to pull this together. And I know there are a number of criticisms that some people have about the African Union, but the African Union is the biggest and right now best game in town for achieving real pan-Africanism. But one of the things that Pan African, the African Union has still not done, and we as Pan Africanists have not done it well enough in our own situations, is to control the education of African people. We are still letting the information that is provided to our youth be governed by what white people did. We are still talking about the great white scientists. We are still talking nonsense about whites invented mathematics. That's why black people can't do it because white people invented it, which is not true. So we basically have got to get control of African education in order for 21st century Pan-Africanism to actually work on the continent and in every other place where African people live outside of the continent. We have to train African youth what we have done, therefore what they can do. It is, the, it is, it is one of the principal keys to the achievement of 21st century Pan-Africanism. There must be Pan-African education. And that's why I definitely agree with that, Baba. I, I have some, my, my ideological training is, is, is going to kick in for a second again, because as we have these types of discourses, everyone's perspective is their perspective, right? And yeah, what we're right. aiming to do is to be able to have a framing that allows for us to balance with what's taking place in the African continent that is progressive looking at the history and bring right. that forward and looking where the best placed ideological practice comes in. So like, for example, in the All African People's Revolutionary Party, which does push that ideological clear line of the total liberation and unification of Africa under scientific socialism, it's very clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah they say that is pan-Africanism. Right, and, and again, and that's part, that, again, that's, that's one thread out of the 360 degrees of what pan African right. requires. That yes. is a thread that is very important and very powerful when implemented by the collective. There are going, and, to, be those, there are going to be those threads, however, that may utilize, because I see it now, where there, the vestiges, the remnants, I'm going to say the little last crumbles of mm -hmm. so-called capitalist imperialism because it has moved from a capitalist imperialist framing to a very fascist everything is connected to some type of police military state which is because what, because, which, they, uh, because because they have to do that to protect the capitalist state correct they, they they the the workers are no longer agreeing to be forced to work and so more and more police and military have to be used to make them work in order to protect the profits of the handful of landowners and resource owners. And again, people are sick of that. And that's but, why, uh, that's why I was that, saying, go ahead, uh, go ahead. Very, very last point. No, it's never the last point. That's just <laughs> another one. That's, I already know we have a few more moments. That's not the last <laughs> point, but I hear you. <laughs> but the <laughs> Kwame Nkrumah is the one who gave the uh, the famous quote about uh, uh, Pan Africanism is uh, the unification of Africa and African people based on scientific socialism. But by the time he passed away in Guinea with um, his friend Sekouturé. He had already moved beyond that. He had already moved beyond that being the only way that Pan-Africanism can be achieved. 
and I wanted, I wanted, I just wanted to get that on the table. Right. Well, no, and that's a very valid piece to put in the table. So then I also would incorporate. So that's why when we, what he grew into, however, was an even more elevated component yeah. of, of you, because we have to use the technology. Yeah. However, the manner in which we use the technology is scientific socialism is the English term that we're going to use to explain this process, but it is not a, it's a type of social governance that is demanding in the 21st century that blends the technology, scientific, it blends right. technology with a social governance that is pro-human and pro our African nation. So for some people, they're going to define that as socialism because what they're defining that as is no longer the vestiges of capitalist, imperialist, apartheid, Zionist, sexist, you know, de I call it demonism. And I also refer to it as outright terrorism because that's what these socioeconomic institutions develop. And it starts to cut away at the very fabric of our yeah. ability to survive and to have the sovereignty that is our own, it's our right. We should not, like when you were mentioning, you know, the vibration and, and the perspective, again, because of your expertise and work and representation, you know, you've worked with the working group of expert, of African experts. You've worked, you know, from Wakar, from a host of, you know, the World Con Conference Against Racism and a host of other African Union-based work projects, mm -hmm. et cetera, and your research on public policy and so forth. It's that the African Union in the 21st century, what they were supposed to have done between 2002, when they were officially formed, to right. the present, they haven't done that. And not only have they not, and I say that with all due respect to those that- No, have, they, they're, they're, no but you're right, you're right. They have not done it. Right, so for the fact that in the diaspora, we have to now reframe, recalibrate, yeah. and then still go into this like boxing mode, to, right. you know, it's like you got to like jam your foot in the door. That's right. not the manner in which you are to deal with your sister and brethren who some of you are completely benefiting from having brought us out of our homeland. So I, right. don't, I don't come from that perspective. I have to ask permission to go back in my great, 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 great grandmother's yard. Right. And, so and, 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 that and, that, keeps coming. and that's where that's where we are. Correct. And that's why I'm saying, you know, there's a lot of efforts that have been done in various organizations. There are a number of organizations, right. you know, um, we, we are involved in so many different components that the Pan-Africanism has grown into really global Africanism, the same yeah. African socialism that Nyeri put in place and it has elevated with that technology, with the reality of a different social order, different social context, different priorities, and a mindset that is very, that has to be developed. Like you said, that education that is coming into not just our youth, but even persons that claim to be elders that are right. very comfortable in a in their comfort zone. And again, I'm not saying anybody should not be comfortable. I like current. I like hot water. <laughs> I, you know, I'm not saying that you shouldn't have, you know, uh, internet and so forth. And if you need cell phone, just be careful with 5G. However, I'm saying on a serious <laughs> note, on a very serious note, there has to be a reciprocal engagement between, and it's happening like families to families, person to person, organization to organization with Africans around the globe and the continent. However, right. the African Union, as you said, you know, what they are focused on is something that we really need to revisit because we really need them to be more proactive. You know, I've heard people in certain act or organizations, you know, connected with the African Union, United Nations, UNESCO, these, you know, right. CARICOM, et cetera. And let me be specific, Caribbean community, United Nations, their, their Office of Human Rights and the various commissions 
you know, their working group of African experts. You know, there is a permanent mission now for people of African descent, even though we're in the seventh year of the International Decade for People of African Descent. And some people, I find this from my students all the time. They have never, no, no, never heard of it. Never heard of it. We're in this, that there is a decade for the international, an international right. decade for people of African descent, where the theme is recognition, justice, and development for people of African descent. But the reality is, we're in the opening of the seventh year, and people still don't know. We have, right. a and, 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 and they'll ask the question okay, <laughs> now that you, now that you're informing me that we are involved in this, what have we gotten done? Right. Can you tell me? Can you tell me what we've done for seven years? Right, right, and, and most people. Right, but they have a really nice five-year report, though. That that five-year report <laughs> makes it. I saw that. That, because some things were done in small, you know, in small spheres, things have been happening, and at the same time, we're in the seventh year of this international decade for people of African descent, and the daily brutality terrorism, murder, rape, slavery, and, and slavery, that, right? Right. I mean, because they keep calling it human trafficking. And that just right. sound really sanitized when you say <laughs> human trafficking, when you really yeah. enslavement. So right. that's, a, that's another area of conversation. So again, it's very easy for us to be together and that hour just go. Yep. So I really would like in these last five to six minutes for you to really kind of clarify and share some closing reflections because it's never the end. We're just <laughs> interval. Right. An interval. There you go. There you go. The intervals between the, basically when you get down to it, what we have had for the last couple of thousand years after cultural groups fought it out and decided who was in charge and fought it out again. Being in charge simply means being in charge of the resources that people need to live and to grow. The water, the food, you know, the, the, uh, the housing. So what we have done is get into, if you wanna be rich, you wanna make more than what you can make with your own kind, then you have to trade. Trade is how you how you make money. And you can only trade if you produce enough mm -hmm. to feed your own belly and then have something left over to, to, uh, to be able to make some money from. So the fight has always been who controls the resources and who controls the trade so that their group benefits and you do all the work for us. So when it comes out down to it, the African Union has focused on the economic arrangements, like the uh, the All African Continental Trade Agreement that they they've just gotten to, which is spectacular. Mm -hmm. It has been thought and it, it has been taught that Africans cannot agree to work together to do anything of substance. Mm -hmm. Surely they cannot decide to share their resources, trade with each other before they trade with the people who can give them all this money. And yet they have done that. Now they have not worked out all the kinks. They're still trying to get all the machinery together, but they have agreed and ratified the agreement that Africa will start trading with each other before they trade with other folk, Europeans. For example, Nigeria, a place where rice is the daily supplement. People eat rice every day in Nigeria. They grow rice, a lot of it. Right. West, West Africa gave uh, the Caribbean, the Canada, the United States, rice. In a place where rice is so important and where they grow so much of it, they are still importing rice. Mm -hmm. Why is Nigeria importing rice from Indonesia and other places and not even buying rice from other African areas? It is control of resources that's always been the issue. 21st century Pan-Africanism is about maintaining African sovereignty so that this large group, this 1.5 billion folk of Africans can control their own resources 
so that they can build the kind of societies that they want and that they will get benefit out of. All of the Africans who are not living on the continent should be allowed participation in that process of Africans controlling African resources for African people. Right. Whether that's dual citizenship, whether that's just I'm coming back, whether y'all give me citizenship or not, whether I am part of the Ghanaian uh, process, a part of the Sierra Leonean process, a part of the Gambian process, I'm coming back. But having that African contact is what we need to push. It's about having another place to go in terms of if these knuckleheads here, the Proud Boys, the, the, um, the, the uh, do wop white boys, whatever they're calling themselves nowadays. Right. These white people, they are arming themselves. Well, they're already armed, but they're threatening yeah. black folk. Right. They're threatening uh, people who have called America, the United States, their home. That we put in all the blood, sweat, and tears. We built this place for you. We want to enjoy some of it now, too. Well, some of these, if enough of these crazy white people get too threatening, my advice is we must have another place to go. Right. Most most African Americans are not going to leave the United States and move to Africa. They're not going to do it unless they're pushed off the cliff. However, we need to have the option available. We need dual citizenships. We need to train ourselves to take a skill to Africa and help us build toward Wakanda, if we want to call it, or any other African uh, 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 higher civilization. But we have our role to play. We must make sure we get involved, even though we're going to have to box our way into it, <laughs> to get them to know that we are here and we are ready and we're going to be involved whether y'all want us to be or not. So 21st century Pan-Africanism is alive. It is growing. It's going to work. And everybody learns some Swahili. Right. That is going. That is going to be the African, the African speaking language, right. the the everyday language, because all Africans must speak at least one language. Right. We we cannot be divided over language. Right. 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 I mean, that's why hearing you is just reiterating some things that are coming up in the chat as well. So I want to, you know, give some word sound power to the elders in this struggle, you know, I, I see some commentary, you know, sure you write some odd shades, some powerful, rec you know, reflection from Baba Sangor Baye, you know, who is serving as the assistant president general of the UNIAACL RC 2020. So give thanks Baba Sangor. You know, I also- And, and Marcus Garvey was right. That's right. Mark Garvey was right. And he was right. And he was a Pan-Africanist, whether people acknowledge that or not. If you're trying to put a 21st century framing on a person that brought together more than 6 million and counting all put right. in some you know, resources, because I keep telling people, multiply $5 times 6 million. We don't, right. we have a hard time doing that now, unless it's for something outside of ourselves. But for the That's movement right. that wasn't in the role of women, you know, his his linkages, the internationalization of the work done by his beloved first wife, Amy Ashwood Garvey, taking that work literally all around the globe, the work in terms of pushing the work, his literature, his voice in print and in all other forms by his second beloved wife, Amy Jacks Garvey, that's something we need to be looking at. And all of those brothers and sisters that were instrumental that spread out throughout right. the globe with that right. consciousness, that African fundamentalism, that when you look at the tenets that come out of that, those tenets that came out of that formulated what people refer to as 20th century Pan-Africanism. We can right. talk about him, Hubert Harrison, Reverend Dr. Edward Woman. I, I'd, I'd, I'd rather not talk. I'd rather not talk about Hubert Harrison. But yeah, okay. <laughs> but let, let me let me let me. That'll be our let, next let, window because I'm ready now. I got some. I have some data. See, we have different because there's things okay. that we never published that persons 
misrepresented, but that's another conversation. But I wanted to share what was in the chat as well. From let me let me let me say let me let me say this last last thing just before we get to the to the uh, chatter. Yeah. Without being um, impolitic, <laughs> without being <laughs> without being uh, trying to be uh, disrespectful, anybody who does not understand that Marcus Garvey was a Pan Africanist, you don't understand Pan Africanism. Mm. Now that may be another discussion for for, for that, another time. That will probably open up another another <laughs> another journey pathway, which is fine, because that's what we do when we do these these versations. And our focus is to do it in a place that we use a very Ubuntu approach. Right. So right. it allows for us to have these these perspectives, share how we see them, and hopefully when right. we reason, we elevate. And we exactly that place because most my of art. Are, right my art, truth justice order reciprocity balance divine righteousness and harmony that's what we're aiming for when we even right. have these versations i also wanted to send a shout out to baba oscar rathway who put in the chat forward ever backward never the revolution there you go continue until hello oscar victory the liberation <laughs> of africa and Africans globally, I think it's really important that Bob, thank you again, Baba Sangor, Africa must unite now and right. give thanks for the reasonings. You know, it allows for people to really take this work to the next level because that's what we're aiming to be able to do. So whether it's through the efforts of the UNIAACL, RC 2020, all of the UNIAACL, and I'll make sure I share that, whether it's coming through the AAPRP, the All African People's Revolutionary Party, the other Black nationalist organizations, global African organizations, indigenous partners in the midst of, of this, progressive Eurasian organizations. What there we're advocating is how do we make sure that our work, our study, and our actions are going to elevate the That's sovereignty right. and sustain it and maintain it and protect it and secure it for our African nation. Every I, I, like I, totally, I totally agree with you. Right. Our, pan, our Pan-African work must be meaningful right. in the growth and development of African sovereignty and African sustainability. Correct. You know, so with that, I'm very grateful for us just having this conversation. We're definitely doing this in support of the long-standing efforts and work that has been done through Harambe radio networks and all that they have been able to do for more than a, for a decade and counting. And, you know, so we send a special shout out to Baba Delani Aman for just putting us in this network to be able to push it forward. We know that there's a lot more to come. We're definitely right. pushing forward for the efforts. And I would again be remiss if I did not highlight, you know, we're sending a special shout out to our sisters and brothers who are currently still enduring a lot of the backlash of Af Pan-African efforts, activity, you know, for their liberation in different parts of the world. A special shout out to our brothers and sisters in West Papua New Guinea who are still yes. being, you know, being chastised, persecuted, and although, although there had there had been a development. And I'm uh, great. And we're going to come forward with that as well. I want to send a special shout out to my sister with sisters with sister space and the UK and praying right. that they too get through because they're doing a lot of work to really help our sister. And sometimes right. we do not offer that support. So I want to send a special shout out, you know, to Sister Queen and Gozi, to Sister Dr. Sandra and all that are working in that effort. You know, a special shout out to my African Queen Mother Warriors, all places, all states, <laughs> Sister Queen Tempu Nefertari, Sister Queen Isis, Sister Dr. Sandra, Sister Queen Aziza, you know where our heart is. And I definitely want us to just take a moment to reflect on Eduardo Chivambo Mondlane, who was assassinated 
despite being a founding president of the Mozambican Liberation Front for Lima. And on February 3rd, 1969, I also wanna take a moment of reflection that in the early hours of February 4th, 1999, 23-year-old Guinean immigrant Amadou Diallo was fatally shot in New York yes. City. And these challenges, and I'm sure everyone that's tuned in can give a whole lot of other dates. So right. we're navigating for the 21st Pan-Africanism to elevate us and right. for us to be able to reclaim unapologetically with strength through truth, justice, order, reciprocity, balance, divine righteousness and harmony as Ma'at. So that there you go forward. We can really move this forward. Thank you so much, Dr. Horn. You know, quite welcome. Privilege as is <laughs> <laughs> the let me let me I don't generally do this because I don't I got too much work to do. But for though <laughs> for those who want to continue the discussion, not argument, discussion, mm -hmm. you can contact me at meeting my yacht at aol.com. That's right, that old AOL stuff. Meeting my yacht at AOL.com. I still got one of those. And I, I keep it there just for discussions with people who want to move forward, not for a bunch of nonsense. Meeting my yacht at AOL.com. It's being put in the chat right now, Baba, so that, that way people will have that that are tuned in on, on Facebook as well. And I appreciate you. I'm looking forward to another opportunity to share in this type of venue. Remember that Culture Heals Humanity Land is our foundation and spiritual harmony unifies us. So we're looking yes. forward to more discussions with action and more planning strategically with work being connected to it so that we can- Exactly, it's all, it's all cause it, cause it, cause it, it's all work. Absolutely, absolutely. And for all our brothers and sisters that are listening, that are, have attachments, connections to the African Union, we say everything that we say in my eye. So there you go. We're making sure that we share that because we are Africans that already claim our home. We there you go. Apologies. That's right. So I That's say right. that in my eye. Shemim Hotep Baba. And this, <laughs> you know Shem, how we do. <laughs> Shem, Shem Hotep. <laughs> Loved it.